Um, all right. <laughs> the uh, the mass uh, in this coming Sunday is the second in uh, Lent, and I I originally had the uh, uh, homily for it. I won't be having it. So I've I've kind of adapted this. What I want to do is take the Old Testament reading from what will be Mass next Sunday and take a look at it. Uh, usually we skip over the Old Testament, but this is a, a, a very interesting story. It's a bit peculiar. So I need to read it to you, that Old Testament part. I'm not going on to the gospel. Um, that will be done by um, whoever has the mass. I've forgotten who does. But this is the, the reading. And it's about uh, Abraham making a covenant with God. He's called Abram. He hasn't gotten the name Abraham yet. So this is it. Uh, God brought Abraham outside and said, look toward heaven and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And Abram believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then God said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O oh Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them in two, laying each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your descendants, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. That's making a covenant. <laughs> well, God and Abram have done that. So he and God participate in a covenant making ritual modeled on an old Hebrew practice. Appropriately, it was called cutting a covenant. We humans, if we choose not to look for surface diversions, embrace the challenge of seeking to understand the great big why of life itself. Well, in this reading, which is rather strange to our ears, I think, ritual is used to express the mystery of covenant. Covenant, that's a strong, strong sense of promise and commitment. Uh, personally, I look at Abraham's dark and frightening experience as a mystical event. Every story is about you, the listener and the reader. How do you enter into the story as a participant and not just an observer? After all, it's about you. Well, art isn't about answers so much as it is about an exploration. Story is a realm where human answers 
proved to be inadequate. In sacred scripture, it's a call to deepen our faith. Words falter here. The great why beckons all of us. It invites you and me to look beyond the framework that our answers have thus far provided. It offers an opportunity to peer into our own depths and to consider how it connects us with God. It's an invitation to perceive reality in a new light. The well, most mornings when I wake up, I recite this pistache of scriptural quotes. You who send forth the light, create the morning, make the sun to rise on the good and on the evil, Enlighten the blindness of our minds with the knowledge of the truth. Lift up the light of your countenance upon us, that in your light we may see light. And at the last, in the light of grace, the light of glory. I found that I need to ask myself, am I willing to loosen my grip on my answers. Often my preconceived ideas falter at mystery's front door. In fact, sometimes they can't even get up the porch steps. To have some understanding of the covenantal mystery described in this story about Abraham and God, we must enter a realm that St. John of the Cross calls in Spanish, nada, nothing. Nothing is not the absence of something. It is the presence of no thing. Things can get in the way of deep meaning, deep meaning. For those of us who practice centering prayer or some other contemplative prayer method, the challenge is to get out of the way and let the spirit clothed in nothing, silence our minds and enliven our hearts. The cloud of unknowing, that cloud in which we are taken beyond anything we can understand, but yet we perceive it. For example, uh, I offer a quote here from Annie Dillard's book, Teaching a Stone to Talk. He says, one day you enter the spread heart of silence where lands dissolve and seas become vapor and ice is sublime under unknown stars. This is the lightless edge where the slopes of knowledge dwindle and love for its own sake, lacking an object, begins. It's from page 48 of her book, Teaching a Stone to Talk. Well, de denying ourselves things, especially in Lent, has value. But Lent is really about conversion. I think the most important approach to conversion is to get out of our own way and let ourselves rest in God's first language, silence. It is the language in which God speaks most deeply to our hearts. In this story of Abram and God, I view Abraham's deep sleep as an expression of a mystical experience. You know that in sleep, we drop our guard 
And that provides an opening into perceiving things in a new way. In a cliche, it gets us outside the box. Well, I would recommend to you a Lenten practice this year to dwell on scripture and let it marinate in the silence of your heart. That's Lexio Divina, listening to scripture with the ears of the heart. Lexio from the Latin means to read, but you and I are trained to read with our minds. We read something, we take in the text and we try to put it to good use. We are in control. But Lexio does just the opposite. In Lexio, we dispose ourselves before the text and let the text be in charge of us. Now that takes some confidence in the text to put yourself in charge of something other than yourself. But that's Lexia. We, we're not really reading. That's, it, it, it goes to our head as soon as we hear that. Listening with the ears of the heart. And in that way, we can follow Abraham into the world of covenant, a place where you can bond more deeply with our Lord. And of course, Lent is a time when that's what we choose to do. It's not about punishing ourselves, although how often we are tempted because the temptations are there all the time to divert our attention to something else, the nearest, the newest app or, or this or that or whatever it might be to fill in the silence because we tend to think that silence is an absence rather than the presence of itself. So you might approach scripture this Lent with that in mind. And when Sunday comes, we'll have not only this story, but the gospel itself and, and see how the presider uh, fleshes that out. If he says something about uh, this Old Testament passage, it might be quite different from what I have said. And if you, if you read scripture in a Lexio Divina way, the same passage may say something very different to you next week or next month or next year, the next time you read the text because you will be in a different place. So the text will meet you in that place. And the richness of it, it won't run out. There isn't just one interpretation of scripture and certainly of the parables, those stories. So I would encourage you to think past ascetical practices, not to get rid of them, but think past them. They are a means to something else. You know that analogy in which uh, someone, it's a particularly beautiful moon and, and you want to alert a, a, another person to that. So you point to the moon and the other person looks at your finger and stays there failing to realize that the finger is pointing to something else. And that's what words do. Words are symbols, like a finger, pointing to something greater than just themselves. But they are the medium. And that's why it's important to think in terms of listening with the ears of the heart. And listen, spelled with the very same letters, but rearranged, spells silent. Try it, you can scramble the letters. So that's the presentation. And um, 
I'm happy to take any uh, questions or um, receive any insights someone else might have. So if you do, I, um, please feel free to speak up. Uh, and I'll turn this over to uh, Chris to open that up. Yeah, you can you can now unmute yourself. I think we're um, we had a problem last week with people joining that shouldn't been on here, but uh, now you can unmute yourself to um, ask Father Mike a question. So if you have questions, just unmute yourself, and he'll be glad to answer. I don't think we have any questions today, Father Micah. Okay. So be it. God bless you all. Thanks, okay. everybody. Join us next week at 2 o'clock. This recording will be up uh, hopefully by the night. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, nice. That was very good. I love when you talk about this. Place. I mean, everybody that I talk to, you have got to tell the market you can see the situation. Because I think that's a practice that we need to really know about, but a forgotten practice for sure that we don't you know, do a lot. Right. And the, the tendency to read is, you know, we're trained to go to our heads. Right. Thank you so much for that. Well, we probably don't even know that.